Hi, everyone, and welcome. And thank you so much for joining us to the Lunch and Learn series, bringing insightful and inspiring educational programs to you through the virtual lens of the Israel Tennis and Education Centers. I'd now like to turn it over to Wendy Slavens, our Lunch and Learn chair and international board member. Wendy? Thanks, Amy. Um, hi, everyone. Welcome for our first of the 2022 Lunch and Learns. Um, I'd like to start off with a special welcome to two of our founders who I think are on today's Zoom, Ian Froman and Bill Lippi. You can give a little wave. Um, also, I'd like to give a shout out to Erez Vider, our global CEO, Kevin Green, international chair of the board, uh, Amy Hendricks, U.S. board president, and Alan um, Yali, C however you Alan, I always screw that up. Sorry, um, CFO and Interim Global Executive Director. Today, during our Lunch and Learn session, we're going to have a conversation about the global anti-Semitism crisis that continues to threaten Jews around the world. Our very own Dan Diker will moderate this session, and later we'll be joined by Rakefed Binyamini, who grew up um, at iTech as a child and was a former number one player in Israel, returned to iTech as the manager of our center in Jaffa. So I'm really excited to introduce our special guest today, Hen Mazig. Hen is an Israeli writer, a columnist for the Jewish Journal, and a globally recognized speaker who has inspired thousands around the world with his story. He has appeared as an expert on Jewish issues on four continents, over 500 college campuses, BBC, Sky News, TEDx, and countless Shabbat dinners. Hen's writing has appeared in the LA Times, the Washington Post, Newsweek, NBC News, The Forward, Jewish Chronicles, um, International Business Times, and numerous other public publications. He was named in Algeminer's Top 100 People Positively Influencing Jewish Life in 2018 and 2021, the Top 50 Online Pro-Israel Influencers, and Top 50 LGBTQ Plus Influencers. Hen's first book, Bad Jew will be released in 2022. So Hen, we are really honored to have you here today for this conversation and I'm going to turn it over to Dan Diker. Wendy, thank you so much. I do appreciate it. And, uh, and nice to see our, our entire iTech family or many of us on screen. And um, uh, it's really wonderful to be able to um, have a chat with all of us together with Hen who's a very special fellow and uh, very, very well known in the public discourse in Israel and, and very appropriate for iTech because uh, as, as we all know, iTech uh, really represents the best of the Israeli rainbow. Uh, as the, Israel is the rainbow nation. Uh, so many different cultures and, and people of different backgrounds and we embrace every child um, of every background and, and, and encourage uh, them boys and girls to become champions in their own right on the court and off the court. And, and Hen really represents, I think in many ways, the greatness of, of that rainbow. This is the lunch and learn from iTech. This is the lunch and learn. And Hen, I'd like to ask you, even though I'd like to see you when I ask you. Oh, there you are. I'd love to ask you uh, first, just to kick our discussion off and we'll continue with our, uh, with our iTech family afterwards with questions and comments and so on. But you know, as an Israeli of Middle Eastern descent, um, we are right now between two major events. The 27th of January was International Holocaust Day, and we are moving within a couple of weeks to something called International Israel Apartheid Week. And the, we find ourselves in between these two uh, events, and I think what connects them, as is no surprise to you, is anti-Semitism. And, and then, of course, from the Holocaust to Israel Apartheid Week. What, what, what is your thinking about the global upsurge of anti-Semitism, uh, especially recently? And we're seeing numbers that are going through the roof uh, in terms of anti-Semitic violent attacks, in terms of, uh, in terms of uh, incitement to violence against Israelis, wherever they are, anywhere in the world. Um, what do you think about this upsurge and, and how uh, how do you make sense of it, and and why has the, the issue of anti-Semitism been of particular interest to, to you as a commentator and a writer and and a community activist? Um, well, first of all, I want to thank you and thank iTech for inviting me. I think you're 
the work you're doing is so important and so impactful and um can talk about that later but i'm just really honored and privileged to to be able to speak to all of you um doing this incredible work i mean we all, i feel like we're all doing our part and um maybe that's also the segue to the answer of the question because i'm i'm doing my part and i really agree with you i feel like today everyone wants to talk about how um how today is like the holocaust or to uh, compare between vaccinations and the holocaust or or compare between uh eating meat and the holocaust or or saying everything they can to compare things to the Holocaust other than talking about the most important thing um, to talk about anti-Semitism, which as we all know is what caused the Holocaust. Um, and I find that uh, this diluting of the memory of the Holocaust and, and uh, uh, trivializing the genocide that took place against third of the Jewish people um, uh, is, uh, is just heartbreaking to all, for, for all of us. But I think the worst part is that um, while, this, while the memory is being erased and we are uh, losing every day more and more Holocaust survivors, um, the responsibility is on us and it's on our shoulders to, to, speak, uh, to speak for their memory, but also to speak uh, for our children. And, our, uh, and I don't have children yet, but I will have one day and uh, I will, I don't want them to grow up in a world where being Jewish is a uh, um, uh, is a is something to be ashamed of. And I'm unfortunately, I feel like we are living in this time that um, people hide their Judaism. That we are told that we need to minimize ourselves so bigots will feel comfortable. Uh, that we need to rewrite Jewish history because we shouldn't speak about our indigenous roots to the land of Israel. Uh, in in a sense, it's it's almost people are telling us that. You know, indigenous rights do not ex do not expire generally unless you're Jewish, and if you're Jewish, then you don't have indigenous rights anymore, um, and you don't have the connection to your homeland, to our homeland, uh, which is for me such an important thing. You know, I live in London now. I still travel to Israel back and forth for my work with the Tel Aviv Institute, um, but uh, I. Um, my heart is really here. My heart is in Israel. I'm currently in Israel, and uh, that's my that's my home. And I, even if I leave away, I'll I'll always have it. And we all remember that during the Holocaust, as you mentioned, that the the world wasn't there for us, and it wasn't before the Holocaust. People thought that things were really good around the world, and democracy were flourishing, and people and you know the culture and art in in Europe was uh, was at its peak. Um, and in one of the you know, one of the times that we thought that we had it so well, um, things uh, turned quite quickly. And it didn't start with death camps and it didn't start with gas chambers. Uh, it started when people became desensitized to Jewish suffering and thought that Jews are, um, are not human. And this dehumanization is what I'm fighting against and what we're trying to stop. Uh, and I, and uh, unfortunately, with, uh, with the, in the age of social media, it's really hard to make a difference when people with millions of followers, you know, we saw during the war that uh, the supermodels uh, Gigi Hadid and Bella Hadid that have more followers than there are Jews alive were spreading hatred and anti-Semitism on their platforms to millions of people that saw it. Um, people that, you know, impression, impression mind that, um, I don't know what they did with the information, but I can assume that they have been tainted against Israel and against the Jewish people. Um, so that's, that's why I'm doing what I'm doing on social media. I think that it's such an important tool. In the past, I used to, as as um, um, as in, you read in my bio, I was I was focusing on writing for the LA Times and BC News. I, I still think it's important to invest in, in in traditional media, but I find that social media is where we're lacking the most, and it's where um, young people are forming their opinions about issues that they know nothing about, that are thousands of, of miles away from their home, um, and they still make up their mind uh, from a social media post. You know, Hen, you, you uh, raise a couple of, of critical points here. One about uh, social media as being a potentially very dangerous platform. And the Hadid sisters have more followers than President Biden. Um, I mean, I'm talking about close to 70 million followers, which is extraordinary. You know, in Mein Kampf, uh, Hitler wrote, uh, many people think it was Goebbels, but it was Hitler who wrote in Mein Kampf, that if you tell a big enough lie to a large enough public um, that you'll convince the public that the lie is true. And, and I say that as a transition to a propagandistic report, and I, and I use that word carefully, which is the amnesty report that was issued uh, recently that, that for the first time ever, 
um, in the, uh, since the, I think the birth of the state of Israel, an international human rights organization basically asserted that Israel is, was born as an apartheid state, which we know according to the United Nations is a, war, is, is a, is a crime against humanity, according to with the UN's uh, understanding of international law. Um, how, how, how do you, how do you uh, think about this, this uh, damning report, which comes on the heels of two other reports in 2021, as is well known to you, the HRW report, Human Rights Watch said basically the same thing in short form, and, and uh, B'Tselem, which is really an Israeli human rights organization, said the same thing at the beginning of 2021. And it, this sounds, uh, it may not sound particularly dangerous to the people who have sort of become, as you said, um, uh, perhaps used to this type of uh, language, but, but how do you understand uh, this report in the context of anti-Semitism and in the context of everything that you're fighting for in digital media? It's you're you're raising a, a, a such an important point because we know that words have meaning and words have power and it's cause and it goes beyond just this report or the social media. By the way, it wasn't just a report that they wrote and published. They also had a, a whole social media campaign around that to present the apartheid as they claim in Israel, which is um, which isn't first of all an insult to people that went through apartheid um, because there's nothing sim even similar to apartheid. Um, and if they are saying that there is apartheid, you may you mentioned earlier, uh, and I mean, that's part of my work is also discussing the Jews from the Middle East and North Africa, my family, my mom came from Iraq, my dad came from Tunisia. 55% um, of Israeli Jews are actually Jews that are from the Middle East and North Africa. We share the same culture with Palestinians. We speak Arabic at home. I spoke, my grandmother still speaks Arabic better than she speaks Hebrew. Um, there, the notion that we are a different race from uh, from the Arabs here in this in this land means that we are you know in they're, they're trying to say that we are uh, we are all not from here just because we're Jewish we're not from this from this area um, of course Ashkenazi Jews that lived in Europe are still for for a few hundred of years still came from here we all started here Jews started in Judea it's in the name um, and the Arabs of course started from Arabia it doesn't mean that they don't have rights to live in this land with us and there is a lot of injustice that we have to work to to um, to improve. But I find it questionable, and I uh, that um, that questionable. I mean, it's it's just so bizarre that um, I'm reading from uh, uh, from living in London. I'm hearing all the time that they're talking about Israel as this uh, uh, Euro this European colonial empire, and in America they're talking about Israel as a racist country, and in Canada they're talking about Israel as a country that genocide its indigenous population, and in South Africa they're saying that Israel is an apartheid state. All of those lies that are um, manufactured and and really, um, uh, um, I think, engineered to uh, to those minds of those people that instead of dealing with the, with the sins of their own country and their own past, uh, they're just blaming Israel for it. Or we saw in America that they blamed Israel for police brutality because there were 30 police officers from America that came to Israel. So instead of talking about police brutality and racism in America uh, and, and speaking about 400 years of, of racism in, in and the problem that they have in this society, uh, they're blaming Israel for training American police officers to be racist. I mean, can you, it's it's more than laughable. And, and it's and I think it's so dangerous because those are uh, the anti-Semitic tropes that, um, that are going to um, really stay with people. And the more, and as you've said, the more uh, Hitler said that, and, and I think there's another uh, 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 first version of it is that, um, that the more you tell a lie, the more people will believe it. And I think the more you are repeating that Israel is an apartheid state, at the end of the day, people would think that Israel is an apartheid state. They would. That's that's what dehumanization is about. It's about seeing Israelis, um, and and there's such a weight to saying, as you said, uh, that it's that that Israel is an apartheid state. It means that we are committing a crime against humanity, um, and it's uh, and and there's double like. There's two things here. First, there's the the one part that it's dangerous for the Jewish community because we are all whether we, no matter how good of a Jew you'd be to non-Jews, at the end of the day you represent this connection to Israel. No matter how much you say that you are anti-Israel, um, the they're saying the last one to be murdered is still going to be murdered. 
Um, so it's you, you can't really pass um, uh, into anti-Semites. Anti-Semites will will only accept Jews uh, uh, if they are uh, if they are dead, because that's the difference, by the way, between anti-Semitism and racism. Uh, the the goal of racism is to enslave people and and um, and colonize people, um, but the goal of anti-Semitism is extinction. That's the that's the difference. They want to kill all Jews. That's what anti-Semites think. They don't want to enslave us. They don't want us to exist. I think it's important to stand on that. But the second part of this accusation is also telling us that the world will not care for us. Um, the world does not care about you guys, Muslims, or, or, uh, uh, or what we're seeing in, you know, all over the Middle East where there's oppression or what's going on in Russia now. Um, the world is not going to stop it. And that's the biggest fear. They don't want to see a war, right? But the world is standing in the side and people are being oppressed and people are being killed every day all over the world. Um, and I think that it's a reminder for us that they're focusing on Israel and, and they're spreading this nonsense of apartheid and, and genocide and all these things. I did during the war in May, I made a post, a, a graphic where um, everyone was talking about how Israel is doing ethnic cleansing and genocide. Um, and I made a post and I said, okay, let's let's just define those things. And I made one chart for to show um, what's a genocide, which is uh, what happened in Europe to the Jewish community, um, that you see the graph changing dramatically. And then I made another post about ethnic cleansing, and I showed what happened to Jews in the Middle East and North Africa, and how a million Jews that lived throughout the Middle East um, were ethnically cleansed. Um, and then I made another graph and showed how the Palestinian population in Israel and Arab Israelis uh, have grown uh, dramatically uh, from since the creation of Israel. Uh, so we can, again, speak about injustice, we can speak about peace, we can speak about ways that we need to live together because Palestinians and Israelis are not going anywhere and we need to figure out how we're moving forward from this conflict. But we should also be uh, very cautious in, in, in the rhetoric that is being used and, and identify this type of rhetoric as a, uh, as a red flag for our community because it's not going to end with Israel. As we saw in May where they went down the streets in LA and beat up Jewish people eating in kosher restaurant or outside my house in London where there was a, an envoy of Palestinian uh, car, cars with Palestinian flags that were calling to rape Jewish women in, in, my, in my city outside my house. And I was waiting for my friends that were talking about Israel and Palestine and spoke about Palestinians to say something about, about something that happening downstairs. I wanted them to say, I condemn this. I condemn that citizens of my own country are calling to rape Jewish women, but none of them said anything. But they had a lot to say about the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. But that was a reminder for me, and I think for all of us, um, why we, we, need, we need a Jewish state. If anything, being so vocally against Israel in, this, in the diaspora is making Jews more uh, strong with our uh, understanding that we need uh, a place to escape to. Sure. You know, you know Ken, it's uh, funny because the Palestinian leadership has publicly blamed Israelis for being ethnic cleansers and racists because we refuse to rape um, Palestinian women during wartime. It, just to, if you want, if we want to get our wrap our heads around the absurdity of what you're talking about. In relation to that, you know, you you represent uh, a unique number of, of of different perspectives and and communities. As you know, a leader in the LGBTQ community in Israel, we have. <laughs> We have a situation which, in which Israel, and that I've noticed in the 32 years that I've been blessed to be here, is one of the most open, accepting, certainly in Tel Aviv, cities for that community. And in fact, so many young men and women from the Palestinian areas in the LGBTQ community are running to Tel Aviv for their lives because in their own, in the Palestinian Authority areas, they are killed and tortured and harassed and intimidated. So tell us from your point of view, um, with regards to the LGBTQ community, how is Israel doing as a, you know, as, as a state, as a refuge, as a, as a, a larger community, um, in, in, uh, and how does it, you know, treat that uh, minority community versus other communities in the Middle East, just with regard to this whole issue of anti-Semitism and the, the inversion of, of appearance and reality? Yeah, it's... <clears throat> Sorry, I, it's a it's such a uh, an important issue because I feel like um, it's part of this thing that no matter what we do, we always are being accused of of 
wrongdoing. Um, and one of the terms that is most popular today in regards to the conversation around LGBTQ rights in Israel is the term pinkwashing, which was used to, um, just, it, it was used to describe how um, uh, companies, big, uh, big companies that would make products with this pink ribbon on it to fight breast cancer. And they found out that only, you know, a cent would go for to fight breast cancer, cancer and people were calling it out and saying, this is pinkwashing. And then this term was reappropriated to discuss, to speak about how Israel should not celebrate its LGBTQ rights. And that term has been used by LGBTQ activists and queer activists from around the world to, to justify why they would ban LGBTQ uh, Israelis or ban LGBTQ movies or will not participate in LGBTQ um, um, events that are related to Israel. Um, and if that's not terrifying, I think that should be terrifying for all of us to think that um, even marginalized minority communities would uh, will turn its, its back on other marginalized group and prey on the most vulnerable people just because of their nationality. It's just a reminder that this hatred knows no border borders and it will not stop. And um, I mean, living in Tel Aviv, I whenever I come here with my partner, um, he's British and we're, you know, we're walking in Tel Aviv and he always tells me like, I feel so safe here. Um, and, and he, you know, he was born and raised in London. Um, so um, to think about that is always uh, so interesting to me. There is a lot of work to be done, but every day things are changing and every day I think we're making progress. We are not where we need to be um, because I still can get married here, um, but that's not because I'm gay. It's because, uh, um, it's because the wedding institutions is being controlled by um, the rabbinical council and the uh, Islamic waqf and the Christian. I mean, so you need to be um, to officially get married in Israel, you have to be uh, affiliated with one of those uh, religious institutions. So that's a big topic of conversation, uh, which is being debated today in this vibrant dem democracy. Um, but we made such a headway when I can uh, go through a surrogacy per process with uh, with funding from Israel, that uh, trans people uh, are able to get funding for their, um, if they need to do a, a sex reassignment uh, procedures, I even in the army, um, they would be treated, I mean, I, I served as a um, as a liaison officer to the international organizations in the West Bank for five years. I lived in I worked in well, worked and lived in uh, uh, in Ramallah and, and in Hebron and then in Jerusalem periphery. Um, and I worked with many Palestinians that did not that were not as lucky as I was. Um, that we had to help them, and those stories are not being publicized because we have to protect their identities. But often I would have Palestinians coming to to us and and either tell us that they're, that they're LGBTQ or, or, or suggest, or we understood that this is why their life is at risk, and we would find a way to bring them to Israel and save their lives. Um, we weren't able to do it all the time, and there was one case where a um, Palestinian person just disappeared after, uh, after coming to us, which we realized exactly what happened. Uh, it was heartbreaking, but um, I'm lucky enough to live in a society where um, where I'm accepted for who I am uh, and that I feel protected. And it's not going to say that it's perfect because there's, again, like everything, there's so much work to be done to, to make it perfect. Um, but we came such a long way and there's so many brave activists that I'm, you know, I'm sitting on the shoulders of giants in, in, in Israel that have been working for, um, to change the legislations, to protect LGBTQ people. I was, I worked, I volunteered at the Israeli LGBTQ National Task Force as a um, when I was in charge of uh, uh, taking care of inquiries from uh, trans folks in, in Israel. And while I was working with all those terrible cases of them being disrespected or being uh, or facing discrimination because of because they're trans, um, every time we reached out to an institution that handled this, uh, we saw there was such a they were so responsive and took care of it immediately and um, and helped make things better for, for this community. So the thing that I we live here in the Middle East and, and LGBTQ folks can feel safe and they have the support of their, I mean, I came out of the closet in the army. I, that was where I felt safe to come out to my commander in the army. Uh, and it was much more challenging to come out to my family than it was to my, uh, to my commander in the IDF. And that's, I mean, that tells you the whole story. You know, tell us um, uh, your role as a humanitarian officer, a liaison officer, goes beyond the LGBTQ story. Yes. And, and, and it's, it's be, I think it, it would really help um, all our iTech family to hear from you the kinds of private stories you heard from Palestinian boys and girls, men and women 
regarding their leadership versus their perhaps feelings about Israel that they wouldn't be able to say publicly, but they would be able to share with you privately? Um, yeah, it's it's interesting. I don't think I've met any Palestinian during my five time, my five years of service that that either told me that they support the Palestinian Authority or support the Palestinian leadership. It was constantly them telling me how much they um, they're disappointed or that they have no faith in their leadership. That um, Mahmoud Abbas and his uh, and his sons and his family is always is is taking over the control over the Palestinian Authority. That. Um, their goal is to stay in power, and they know that if there will be a Palestinian state, they will be challenged and probably will not be elected to lead the, if there was real election for the Palestinian Authority, Mahmoud Abbas will not stay in power. We should remember that he's been there for over a decade, um, and he was never elected, and the reports of his salary uh, goes between, uh, I heard, uh, half a million to one million dollars a month, um, and there's different reports. I don't know exactly how much money he's getting, but I'm sure it's a lot. Um, um, and he has a mansion and he has his kids are all working in the government um, there. That was the experience that I had from speaking to Palestinians uh, on a daily basis. I, you know, I lived in Hebron. I was my job was to work with all the international organizations and help them execute uh, international projects, humanitarian projects to help uh, the Palestinian civilians. So it was everything from building hospitals to uh, roads and uh, uh, or taking care of real emergencies. and. There were so many situations that we saved lives of Palestinians um, in, in the work that my unit was doing, the COGAT unit, which stands for the Coordinator of Government Activities in the Territories. It's an IDF unit that does this work all over the West Bank and in the Gaza border. Um, and they were often so grateful to us and so grateful for what we've done. Um, and it was, it's heartwarming, but it's also really um, heartbreaking in a sense that um, these people would in a heartbeat move to Israel. They would, you know, they would take the Israeli leadership. They would love to live in Israel um, in this apartheid state, allegedly, but the, rather than staying in the West Bank, which is um, which is very telling. And and but again, it's really sad to see that um the there's no really solution for uh for them. Um I would say, I mean, there were many that were uh that th that that told me quite explicitly that they think that Israel should just take over the whole thing and and just uh, run the Palestinian Authority for them or to uh, annex the World Bank. Um, the officials that I was working with never said that. The officials were all talking about uh, two states and or not even two states. All of them were talking about Palestine uh, and suggesting that Israel shouldn't exist. Um, but but the people themselves, and if you go to the West Bank and have conversations with them, um, if it's not people that were trained to say specific things, they would tell you, they would tell you the same thing. Mm -hmm. And in terms of what people were telling you and what the discourse is in the West, and you come from London, by the way, where a lot of this discourse takes place. There's a lot of Islamic organizations in London. There's a lot of, uh, you know, there's a lot of historical guilt in London, because remember, it was London that established the Balfour Declaration and, uh, and led the mandate, controlled, supervised the mandate for Palestine. Uh, until 19, uh, until 1947, um, the, the discourse in the West says that if they call Israel an apartheid state or an ethnic cleanser or, or and even worse, you know, racist and all these other horrible adjectives, that that's really only political criticism. This is as opposed to anti-Semitism, which how we started our, which is the way we started our conversation. How, how do you see um, this type of what appears to be a disconnect? Um, is there such a thing as the new anti-Semitism, which is collective anti-Semitism against the Jewish nation as a collective and its nation state? Or do you accept the idea that people could call Israel an apartheid state or accuse it of, of these type of you know, uh, uh, racist and genocidal crimes against humanity, the ICC, the International Court of Justice, and have that really be categorized and defined simply as legitimate political criticism? I mean, the, the answer is in the question. If it was a legitimate criticism, it wouldn't be calls for, 
to end the like I, I hear that a lot people will tell me well you know anti-zionists are just critical of israel um, but they're not critical of israel they're critical of its existence they don't want israel to exist that's the goal and it's the same thing with accusing israel of being a genocidal apartheid state that commits crime against crimes against humanity if you're saying that a country is committing crimes against humanity and you're saying that its foundation is based on crimes against humanity, you're saying that this country has no legitimate right to exist. So that's not criticism. There is criticism and you can, you know, and, and I would even accept people that are anti-Zionist that are saying every day are posting 193 posts uh, against the existence of every country in the world and that they will call out all the crimes that every country in the world commits. Um, and then I would have a conversation with them. And then my question would be, okay, so you don't think Israel should have the right to exist um, because you're saying that we live on stolen land, um, but have you checked the name of the tribe that you live on their land? And have you ever done anything for, the, for this tribe um, that you have live on the stolen land of? Um, Israel is such a, I think it's so hard for people to digest the fact that we are indigenous people, uh, that we are native to this land, um, and that we have reclaimed our indigenous homeland. And it's one of the most successful stories of land back um, uh, initiatives in the world because we have reclaimed our ancient homeland, we have re reclaimed our culture, um, and we are indigenous people because because of our connection to this land. I have a, one of the fellows that we're working with at Tel Aviv Institute at my, at my organization. She's a Native American Jewish woman that lives in New Mexico. And she really helped me make sense of this. And she said, you know, you, us as Jews, she's both Jewish and Native, so it's easy for her to see. And she says, us as Jews, we're, we're staying indigenous to this land as long as we maintain the connection to this land. And we do every day when we pray towards Jerusalem, that's connection with the land. Uh, oh. My brother just got married and, uh, and when he broke the glass, he remembered Jerusalem. Uh, and everything we do is, is land orientated. And Judaism is such an agri agri agricultural uh, uh, religion. You know, we take the four species of the, uh, of the plants on Sukkot and we wave them in six direction of, of the wind. That this is indigenous practice. Um, we are, you know, in, in, in every Friday, we invite we spirits, spirits into our home. Into our we call it the angels of peace, and we're singing, welcoming them and asking them to bless us. But this is inviting spirits or, um, or Elijah. Uh, we are indigenous people, and we are native people, and we maintain our connection to our land, and we have reclaimed that. And it's one of the most successful story of indigenous people reclaiming their land. And there is an empire in the Middle East, but it's not Israel. It's the Arab empire that has... Uh, has done terrible things to minorities in this area, has done terrible things to my family that has expelled them and, and forced them out. And it's not because of the Holocaust that Israel exists. Israel exists because we have right to live here. This is our land. It doesn't mean that no one else has the right to live here, but it just means it's not more and not less than, um, than the fact that Jews have the national rights to live in our uh, indigenous uh, homeland um, and, that, uh, and that we are an um, anti-imperial, anti-colonial initiative because there are you know the the way the the best test to find to find out if an imperial force was controlling an area or a country is by language. Uh, the reason that I speak English is because English is an imperial language. Uh, French is an imperial language. It was promoted through uh, uh, colonialism of other countries and 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 forcing imperial homogeny in those places. Um, uh, and the same way that Spanish is an imperial language. And yes, Arabic is also an imperial language, and that's why it's spoken in so many countries. Uh, Israel is the only country where Hebrew is spoken. Hebrew is, uh, is an, it, we are, it, people are reversing the, uh, the nation empire um, equation and turning Israel into a nation, uh, into an empire and can't be an empire. It's, if, if Israel was really colonizing other, you know, Israel is 0.3% of the Middle East, 0.03% of the Middle East. Um, we are a tiny country that is fighting against the imperialism of the Arab world. And with, I'm really happy about the, the uh, Abrahamic Accords because it's leading us towards peace. But we should remember also that those countries are, uh, are part of the Arab empire and we, uh, and have been responsible, some of them, to the ethnic cleansing of Jews and, and from their countries. Um, and you know, and this, the, the land that was taken from Jews from the Middle East and North Africa is equal to five times the size of the state of Israel today. So five times the size of the state of Israel today, but put together is the amount of land that was taken from us. Um, so there's a lot of things here, but I just, uh, I, I don't know, did I answer your question? I'm sorry. Yes, okay. absolutely, absolutely. The only, the only addendum I would add to the um, to the your observation on is on uh, Hebrew being spoken in Israel and that uh, refutes the idea that we're in Miami, Los Angeles, and New York. 
I'm, I wonder whether those are branches of the empire as well in terms of the amount of Hebrew spoken in those three states. <laughs> well, <laughs> but, officially. <laughs> <laughs> well, aside from that, that was just that, you know, that, that was just uh, sponsor identification there. Um, I want to, I, I want to, um, we only have a few more minutes uh, for your opening comments. I want to pick up on what you said about the Abraham Accords. Because if you walk the streets where you live, we are now in your home in Tel Aviv, you would bump into the ambassadors of the United Arab Emirates of Morocco and Bahrain on your way, whether it's uh, going to the park or whether it's going on the Tayelet, uh, going to uh, you know, one of the wonderful restaurants in Tel, in Tel Aviv. Um, and, and yet there seems to be another disconnect on this point of the value and importance and significance of the Abraham Accords, um, you know, the normalizing of relationships between Morocco, Bahrain, the UAE, uh, and even Sudan to a degree, um, who was Israel's arch enemy, right, in 1967, no peace, no recognition, and uh, no negotiations, which was Khartoum in Sudan. Today, it's very different. In the West, however, there seems to be a discourse still, of, but the Palestinian issue has not been solved. So thank you very much for the Abraham Accords, but the discourse, if you would, for example, in, in uh, J Street, um, the mainstream liberal left uh, Israel, uh, Jewish community, is that it's much more important on the Palestinian issue than it is in the Abraham Accords. In Israel and the Middle East, it seems to be very different. Can you weigh in on this, what appears to be this growing disconnect between East and West? Yeah, and I heard that today that Jamal Bauman was uh, pulled his support from the Abraham Accord bill, uh, which is really um, sad to say. I mean, I, it's really beyond me how those peace organizations are, um, are standing against peace. Um, it's the Abraham Accord, it, it was literally created to promote peace in the Middle East. Um, and opposing it is just opposing coexistence. That's what it is. And it's, uh, um, and I feel like it's not, it's really not about Palestinian rights, um, and if and if anything, I think this would really promote peace with the Palestinians. The fact that more and more Arab countries are uh, are connecting with Israel and um, and creating peace in the in, in the Middle East. I mean, it, it's it's really a, trying to make sense of an answer to this to your question about um, pro peace or or organizations that describe themselves as pro peace standing against a peace accord. Um, how do you make sense of it? Um, I don't know. I mean, I, I actually, I have no answer to this question. It's a very, it is a very difficult question. It's one that, that I think we all struggle with in, in here in the discourse in Israel. And I, I think that it ties into the whole apartheid, the whole apartheid uh, a strategy. I, I'll just mention that, uh, you know, the, the, the Palestinian leadership had adopted as early as 1961, Israel as a, a Nazi apartheid state. That, those, those words were actually spoken by none other than, um, uh, than Ahmed Shukeri, who was the first uh, leader of the PLO, who said in opposition to Israel's putting Eichmann on trial for Nazi crimes, he said Israel is Eichmann in a state um, and, and called us South Africa, a little uh, South African apartheid. Even at that time, that was many years before we entered um, the West Bank, Judea and Samaria. So that, that has obviously been a real, that has really captivated the discourse in, uh, in, in the West, and I think is one of the keys <clears throat> to, this, to this disconnect. But on a more positive note, when we talk about your very eloquent description of, of uh, the Abraham Accord, this is what the Israel Tennis and Education Centers have really been trying to um, embrace, is, is the Abraham Accords inside of Israel. And in fact, um, we have, uh, um, you may or may not know, Ken, but we, we have moved full speed ahead in 20, since 2020 in bringing um, championship tennis and, and simply as well as regular tennis lovers tennis into Taibe, into Rahat, embracing the children and, and having them developing the coaches there, men and women. And, and we are, for the first time, making tremendous progress there. And what I'd like to do is to bring into this conversation it's sort of our own Abraham Accords, if you will, within Israel, um, is Rekepet Binyamini, who is uh, one of uh, the great successes of the Israel Tennis and Education Centers. And Rekepet grew up um, as a child in the ITC, and I've known Rekepet since she was 13 and I was a bit older. 
and we played together, we trained together, we sort of grew up together. And, and Rakefit was a, 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 a break, greatly successful manager of both Jaffa uh, and the Tel Aviv, our Tel Aviv centers. And she's very sensitive to and a part of the minority, uh, of the minority experience in Israel. And she's helped many children from many different minorities excel in Israel. And Rakefit, share with us a little bit about how, in your experience as a manager and now as a, a senior manager of, of, of outreach and a liaison, how iTech has really tried to bridge that divide between cultures, between communities, between minorities, and how we're doing today from your point of view, Rakefit. So thank you, Dan, and thank you, Chen, for uh, saying all these strong words. And I really want to start with something that uh, will move, move you a little bit in your chairs. And uh, I want to start with saying that sports is uh, an unequal place. And I want you to look at your place where you live and see where the tennis, and where the te the tennis is located and where uh, the golf is located and who, is, who are going there and who are going to do yoga and Pilates and martial arts and all this. And you can look at the parking lot and you see that many, the cars are kind of, you know, similar and the people are from the same status. And pr probably a lot of them are university graduates. And I want you now to think of uh, the tennis centers where they are located in Ofakim, or Arad, or Kiryat Shmona, or Tiberia. And a community of children coming to play tennis for the first time, they might live a block from each other. They've never spoke with each other. Maybe they live, they are neighbors, and they come to do this, the same sport. Some of them are Arabs, some of them are Jews, some of them are Ethiopians, Russians, all as Dan says, the rainbow. And they have the same interest. We want to play tennis. They get the same equipment. They get the same clothes. And they go on the court. And I want to take you and drill it a little bit further down and say that um, they start playing. They cooperate with each other. They play doubles together, Arabs and Jews, girls and boys. They compete with each other. And then they decide to go have a, they go to the kiosk, have a Coke together and start talking. And they realize that they have common interests. They like the same singers. They hate math. And they see that the person behind what they heard all the time is a human being. It's just a boy, just like them, just a girl, just like them. And it's not what they heard at home or the prejudice and stereotypes and how, what, how their family perceived this community. And 46 years ago, six visioners has a crazy idea to build tennis centers in Israel. In, at that time, it was in Ramat Sharon. Ramat Sharon at that time was a strawberry fields and, uh, and oranges trees. And who is crazy enough to build a tennis center in a place like this? You don't invest in a place like this. You invest in places where you want to see the investment. You want to see the ROI. You want to see that the return on investment. You don't to lose your money. They were crazy enough to have a vision to bring children from Israel and to give them the chance to play tennis so they can change lives through tennis. They never ever thought that through that thing, they will create a world champion like Andy Ram. They will create a captain uh, for Federation Cup like Ronen Morali. And 100, they will touch the lives of hundreds of thousands of children. They never thought that they will have, that I will stand today. I was there a child, 12 years old, that came to the tennis center. They, I have never think that I will now stand and say, from the point I was there, that we have 23, 23 tennis centers and extensions all over Israel, and it's all in peripheral areas. We, as a society, are very privileged. We have everything. 
we have a food, we have a house, we, have, we are healthy, we have education. We have the obligation to have these kids that, in, that are, cannot have what we have, that do not know anything about tennis. When we came to Taipei, they don't even have a tennis court. How can they know to play tennis if they don't even have a tennis court there? They don't know the rules. They don't know what the tennis racket is. They don't know how to play the game. We are crazy enough to be there, to go inside, and to see how through tennis we close gaps. We give a chance. The, our society looks at things in a homogenic way. Like they say, all Arabs are inferior to Jews. All Bedouins are violent. Uh, from Asia, all Asians brought COVID to uh, the country. Uh, Ethiopians are nice. And we have all these stigmas and stereotypes. And these are how children are built. But when we, they come to the center and we let them play with each other, they understand that they can think differently, that the, the, the young generation, we can educate them from, from being young. They can see that we are not different than them. They are good and bad in Arabs. They are good and bad in Jews. They, uh, Arabs can be Jews and Jews can be Arabs. It's okay. We can see that we can live together in a place where peace and the democracy and, and, and a nice life, we can live together. And, uh, and, you know, there is discrimination all over the world. There is violence against women. There is discrimination against gays, against uh, blacks, against Hispanic. All the time there is discrimination. But the only thing that we do in the tennis center is we try to educate them. And you have to understand that these children that come to the tennis center, a lot of them come from very traditional homes. The girls that come there are educated to be submissive, to be soft, to be gentle. And it's not characterized with the, 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 the good, the strong athlete, the great athlete. And then they have to go to the tennis court they have first to be strong enough to in, inside themselves to break, to break the barriers that already their families put on them, the society put on them. Just to step in the tennis court, it's already, they have to be very, very strong. And then in our groups, we combine them, boys and girls together. Girls play with boys, girls beat boys. They see they can be strong. So how can they do it with this conflict that a girl can be, should be soft and gentle and can be an athlete. How can it be that our society uh, appreciate greatly success and achieving and being number one and winning? And these girls that come, they cannot meet these requests. So what we do is we tell them, we explain them that it's okay, it's not contradicting, it's not contradicting. You can choose what you want to be. You can choose to win on the tennis court. You can choose to become a great player or to be a leader and you still can be sensitive and you can still be and you can still be soft and it's okay. It's up to you to decide. And I want uh, and I want uh, uh, really to say that another really one of the strong things of tennis, it's the harmony of this game. This game, uh, it works on your body and on your mind. Those children that go to school and they meet each other and sometimes they talk, sometimes they don't talk, it's, it's working only on their mind. What, when they come to tennis, they get their aggression out. We all know that if we are not in a good mood, we smile, that there is a, a dopamine that releases in our head. So we all know that by doing exercise, we start feeling good about ourselves and that we, we, we work on our self-esteem and self-will and confidence. And this is really what tennis does. And I must end up with this because a lot of these people that are here watching uh, this uh, Zoom is that 
we are here because of you. It's, it's very nice to receive things. And we are all happy, very happy when we get presents and when we get positive feedback. But what really makes people happy? This, what I said, is long, is short term happiness. But what really makes people happy for long term is when you give, is when you make other people feel good. When it's not only giving material things and, 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 and money, and, but it's also giving those children that I was talking about, compassion, uh, ex acceptance, tolerance, love, hug. And I think this is what the Penny Center represents. It represents, we are here for you. We are a second home. We are a place where you can take all your aggression out. You can share with us everything you have, just like Hen said that he got out of the closet to his uh, 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 commander. A girl got, got out of the closet to me. She wanted to commit suicide. She said, I hate myself. I cannot stand it. I was a place where she could share her feelings with me. And thanks God she's playing now great tennis. Her father accepts her, her mother accepts her. This is what we do. And I think for the last 46 years, I'm, you know, I interview uh, secretaries and coaches and they are 28 years old, and they already have passed like 20 jobs. Hey, I've been in one job all my life, maybe two jobs all my life. All my life. I ask myself, what have been there for so many years? Why? And every time I gave the same answer, because I want to make a change, because I want to make children smile, because I'm obligated to give them the opportunity to have what I have. Wonderful. Wow. Brilliant. Absolutely sensational, Rakefet. Uh, I think you and Hen together, standing shoulder to shoulder, represent and convey the same message and, and the principles that, that we stand for of, of, of equality and excellence and leadership and education. I think that's what Hen was talking about in his description. And that's what he's about. That's what you're about. And, and that's very much what Eris Vider, our great CEO, always says. It's those principles and joy. And you bring joy to the lives of children, making them champions on the court and off the court. And uh, Eris always emphasizes that because it all begins with joy, bringing joy, giving joy. So thank you, both of you, for, uh, for really offering us a certain kind of joy, even though Hen was giving us a, a, a tougher uh, reality, but still with great joy in his heart and great eloquence. And both of you uh, uh, helped uh, really expand our knowledge and our understanding. And I'm gonna turn it over to Wendy now. At, uh, I think we're right on time, Wendy, for your yep. concluding remarks and, and comments about, about where we are and where we're going. Thanks, Dan. Um, always, as always, I'm... Amazing. Thank you, Hen, for being part of us today. I just I feel like you're you're one of us now. You really have a good um, uh, idea of what we do, and we so appreciate everything that you have to say um, on a daily basis. I watch you and McCaffrey. I mean, we're so proud, and thank you. Thank you, Will Weepy. Um, and this is just the perfect um, entree into we I, I'm, we are offering our first young leadership, young professional trip to Israel on June um, 9th to the 16th for 25 to 38 year olds as a guideline. And like, if you didn't get it from Hen and Rakefet, like you need to be there. Like this generation, you're our next gen. You are, you need to hear what's going on and, and witness it firsthand. And we like donors on right now, please like tell your children, your grandchildren, this is your legacy iTech, this is your investment and we need to keep it going. So, I mean, you, we have the contact me, contact Lauren, contact anyone and get the information posted on your social media. Just tell everyone we need to get this younger generation to Israel and witness for themselves and become and come home and be ambassadors. So on that note, um, Thank you all for being here and we look forward to our next Lunch and Learn, which you'll hear from us soon and, um, and have a great day. <laughs>